Welcome to Living History UK. My name is Steve Davis and this is the British soldier of the 6th of June 1944. Following the invasion of mainland Europe in September 1943, when Allied troops assaulted the soft underbelly, as Churchill called it, of Italy, Allied troops assaulted the shores of France at Normandy. And although an elaborate deception plan had fooled the Germans into thinking that the main assault would take place at or near Calais, the main assault actually came at Normandy. But nonetheless, the beaches were very well defended and would, on the whole, prove a tough nut to crack. Originally planned for the 5th of June 1944, foul weather had pushed the invasion back one day. On the night of the 5th, 6th of June, paratroopers as well as glider-borne infantry assaulted key objectives behind enemy lines, such as the bridges over the Cairn and Orne canals, which were taken by the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry. These key objectives were to be held and would mean that the Germans would not be able to reinforce the beaches and defences on the coast. The first assault wave hit the sword and gold beaches at approximately 0725 hours on the morning of the 6th of June. But we will focus on the uniform that the average British infantryman wore landing on those beaches on the 6th of June. So the regular infantrymen, and indeed all infantrymen in the British Army, wore battle dress, which is this battle dress blouse here, you can see. It's of a wool serge construction, and this is actually the austerity pattern. You can see the buttons on the centre front here are actually exposed. The original battle dress serge actually had covered buttons, and as the war ground on, economy measures came into play. And this was not just about saving money in terms of less cloth but it was more importantly about saving time. The ordinary British soldier used 37 pattern web equipment typically blanco in shade 103 seen here. Now from a living history perspective it's very commonplace to see reenactors using KG3 which is a much darker version of blanco. Now in 1944, it's safe to say that numerous shades of Blanco were being used. At the start of the war, we had shade 97. Mid-war, we had 103. And then very late war, we had KG3. And the main reason, I believe, why many reenactors use KG3 Blanco is because so many of the original blocks survive. And it's very rare to find 103 and even rarer to find number 97. And from judging and looking at period photographs of the time, even though they're in black and white, you can see the varying shades of colour on the web equipment throughout the period, specifically 1944. So using a bit of an educatory, a well-educated guess, I should say, the Blanco I've chosen is 103. So talking about the webbing, shown here is the typical setup. So we've got the two basic pouches. These are both Mark III. We've got the standard braces, belt, we've got the water bottle on the side, and we've also got at the side the haversack worn on the left hip. And we'll turn the mannequin round now and show you what the rear of the 37 pattern web equipment looked like uh, when a soldier was arriving on Sword or Gold Beach on the 6th of June 44. So here we can see the rear of the soldier. Now this item here is the large pack or valise as it's traditionally called and you can see this blanket worn around the outside of the pack. Many of the troops actually carried these blankets and you can see that from many original photos. We can also see the entrenching tool here as well, worn small at the back. This is the pig sticker, we'll talk about that shortly. We've also got the haversack here, this is also called the small pack. 
And when the large pack wasn't being worn, a small pack would be worn on the back instead. And of course, we've also got the infamous enamel mug, which by this point of the war was brown instead of white as it had been during the early war. And the other item we've got is the water bottle worn on the right hip. So come D-Day, which is obviously June the 6th, 1944, all British infantry were armed with this, which is the number four Lee Enfield. And it's, as you can see, pretty much the same rifle as the Mark III, which the British used in the First World War, and also all the way up until about 1942-43. But by 1944, the standard rifle that troops were carrying and being armed with was this. There was only a couple of changes, really. It was still a bolt action rifle, carried 10 rounds in the magazine, single shot, very effective and very accurate rifle too. The main difference with this was the addition of the sights, the adjustable sights, but also the fact that you could use a different type of bayonet, which was called the pig sticker bayonet. The spike bayonet, or pig sticker as it was nicknamed, was a much shorter bayonet than the 1907 pattern, and thus was much cheaper to produce. It was also much more suited to the anticipated urban fighting which D-Day would bring. One man per section would carry the Bren light machine gun. One man per platoon would carry the two inch mortar. At this point in the war, anti-tank assets were now under the direct command of the company commander. At the time of D-Day, the perception that gas would be used against either the populace or armed forces had severely diminished. However, troops still carried anti-gas equipment. This is the lightweight respirator, and it was worn one of two ways by the troops. It was either worn slung over the left shoulder on the hip, or it was worn attached to the rear of the waistband. Essentially, this was a much more functional respirator to use than the respirators that the troops used at the outbreak of the Second World War. A small number of troops assaulting the beaches on D-Day actually wore gas detection brassards, such as this photo here of the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry just before they were about to take off and land on the night of the 5th of June. Shown here is the Mark III or Turtle Helmet, which was a revolutionary design. The new helmet was only issued to a small number of troops of the British and Canadian forces, and it was first seen in action on D-Day. This style of helmet actually became the standard issue after the war, and bar a couple of changes to the liner and the chin strap, stayed in service with the British Army right up until the 1980s. The item seen here on the chest is the life belt, and this was worn by all British and Canadian troops landing on the 6th of June. If the soldier found themselves in difficulty, they'd be able to inflate the life belt, and it was worn under the equipment. As soon as the troops got onto the beach, this would be the first item they would take off and get rid of. This one's actually dated 1943, and it still inflates as well, so it's marvellous that this has actually survived so long. One of the key advancements from the outbreak of the war was the introduction of these. And these are ration packs. And these are the first 24 hour ration packs issued to British troops. When the troops were in the assault, such as on D-Day, they actually carried two of these and one would have been carried in each mess tin in their haversack. The main thrust behind this idea was to keep the troops self-sufficient and not to rely on field kitchens, which of course would have taken a couple of days to be operational. This meant that the troops could be self-sufficient, march on their stomachs as well as their feet, and take ground and break out at the beachhead, which was captured around Sword and Gold beaches on the 6th of June. Of course, D-Day was a major success, and the equipment used by the troops on D-Day saw them right through until the end of the war. As the Normandy campaign and subsequent breakout ground on, some equipment fell out of use, such as the lightweight respirator. Troops jettisoned the respirator itself and used the bag to carry personal equipment and or rations. There's a bit of bonus content. Here's what a section commander would have looked like in late 1944, following the D-Day invasion of Normandy. You can see the camouflage windproof smock 
as well as the Mark II stem, which is what section commanders typically carried in the field. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please continue to support us on TikTok and Patreon. And remember, you can always donate to our project by following the link in the description below. But for now, this is Living History UK, over and out.